Welcome. Welcome to MHUB. Can I get a show of hands? Or anyone here, this is the first time they've been here? Oh, wow. It's quite a bit. And then can I get a show of hands of all the members in the room? Nice. Um, welcome to MHUB. My name is Bill Fienup. I'm a co-founder and director of Innovation Services. Uh, MHUB is a nonprofit organization. Um, our goal is to lower the barriers to entry to physical product development and create the conditions for product innovation to thrive. And we do that by giving our members access to uh, tools, resources, mentorship, access to equipment, uh, access to uh, manufacturing connections, uh, and really a community to help them build products. We want to lower the barrier to entry and give them all the resources that they need to be successful. Um, behind this wall, there's about 63,000 square feet of space at MHUB. Uh, we have seven different shops and labs. Uh, we've got a 3D printing lab, CNC equipment, um, metal, uh, metal forming lab, um, as well as a lot of other equipment that people need to develop products. And we're here to help. And everybody here um, is a very collaborative you know, culture in nature, so everybody helps each other out. Um, I want to talk about the impact that MHUB has made in the past two years. So we've had about 1,000 members come through this space um, and, and build 260 companies. Um, collectively, those members have raised $57 million and generated $48 million in revenue. Um, we've had uh, uh, 400 products launched and 700 jobs created. That's a lot of impact in just two years. Um, it's also a tradition that we give our members uh, an opportunity to, to pitch uh, during these sessions. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Harold from Nomo Diagnostics to talk about his company. So I was for fortunate enough to be asked to share a story of Nomo Diagnostics. Thank you. Fortunate enough to be asked to share a story of Nomo Diagnostics with you. We started at MHUB about a year ago. Uh, we've actually got a helmet connection, uh, much like Carbon does, and they actually just showed me some of their early padding technology. And if you can think of sensors embedded into this type of structure, is exactly what we're working on. So the story starts at Columbia University in New York. Frustrated neurologists are seeing uh, NCAA and NFL football players much too late in the concussion uh, diagnostic protocol. Uh, and what wound up happening is he paired with a very bright engineer at Columbia University and said, we're going to solve this problem. Some of the early funding was provided by the Coulter Foundation, which pairs scientists with uh, clinicians. They were motivated by... Uh, People retiring from the sport when they, because the symptoms weren't monitored soon enough. And also, there was about a 10 year failure of motion devices, different types of accelerometer technologies that never showed clinical evidence to brain health. So, what we're trying to do is real time identification of concussion. Right now, the current standard is only 20 to 40 percent of concussions are identified, and you either need to raise your hand and say, I need to be looked at, or somebody needs to look at you uh, and say, You should be looked at. We're trying to automate this by putting all the technology onto a chip with sensors so that you can report out based on this informed decision that's looking at brain waves, so not acceleration, not motion, but doing direct measurements of brain waves. Most people are affected by limb injury after a concussion, 30, 50 to 300 percent increased risk of uh, an orthopedic limb injury of some kind because they don't have their full faculties about them. And if left unchecked, we hear a lot about the neurocognitive declines that people have in later years, chronic traumatic encephalopathy being one of the worst. So we'll have an embedded sensor system that'll go into padding like this, or round padding. On the sidelines, there'll be a health monitoring application looking and evaluating in real time what's going on. And then we'll have a longitudinal database built on an Amazon web structure for managing the health-related uh, data sets that we have. 
Uh, it's a completely untapped market that we estimate to be roughly $100 billion. And the reason for that is, is there's sports applications, there's military applications, and then there's safety helmet applications as well. Nobody's working on this that we've come across with brainwave monitoring technology. Some of our early funding came from New York uh, through a strategic channel partner. Uh, we've also had some military funding through MD5. How many people know what MD5 is? Nobody. Then I'm going to give them a quick plug. It's a, about a year or two old national, let me, I want to make sure that I get this right, national security technology accelerator that's run by the Department of Defense. They're looking for a lot of interesting applications and they've accelerated their entire funding process so that you can get started in 30 days and then when you're moving from phase one into phase two, rather than a traditional SBIR which could take six to eight months, they can do it within a, about a month as well. And so we're moving from phase one into phase two right now and looking at writing a protocol to test the military helmet with uh, squads that are doing either breaching or paratroopers. Lastly, thank you MHUB for being the starting point in our jury. They provided me with the talent. My first hire came out of a career fair that they ran at, the, at IAT. Uh, and they've connected me with some resources and consultants in the space as well managing their gig board and a few other things. So a big thank you to uh, MHUB for that. Thank you. Thank you, Harold. Um, so this Industry Disruptors event is about additive manufacturing and 3D printing. Uh, this is a topic that I'm very passionate about. And actually, about 20 years ago, I interned at uh, a company called Z Corp. Um, and they are uh, a 3D printing company, and they have a, a powder-based um, additive manufacturing process where they print binder onto powder. Um, and I was just an intern, but I was very passionate about solving some of their problems. The particular problem they posed me was aligning the clear heads to the other inkjet heads so you get multicolor prints. Um, and uh, the project was a success that came out with a couple of patents, um, and that was 20 years ago. A lot has been done in additive manufacturing since. Um, I think there's over seven, maybe eight different manufacturing processes that involve um, additive manufacturing. Um, tonight we're gonna hear um, about the latest, most disruptive technology that is 100 times faster um, than other technologies. Uh, it is so fast that it can be used in manufacturing processes. So you can actually get 3D printed parts um, that are designed and made custom to your specific need. Um, so tonight we're going to hear from Dr. Joseph De Simon, um, and, and he's the CEO and co-founder of Carbon. Welcome up. Well, thank you very much uh, for including me uh, in your event here. It was pretty uh, interesting to see the range of technologies, the range of businesses coming here, coming together, and, and uh, all of us as entrepreneurs have a lot of uh, common themes and common issues that we uh, struggle with, and it was good to hear some more stories out there, and I and, uh, would love to share some more. Um, but thank you for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about what the team is doing, and before I do that, I thought I would put some things into context first. Um, and think about, you know, what happened in 2D printing. And, uh, and you think about the offset printing and the printing press and what's being done today in digital. And in the context of a printing press, I, I want you to just hone in on the mechanical aspects of it, right? That you open it up, you have a master template, you slide paper in, you close it up, you transfer the ink to the paper, you open it back up, and you take the paper out. And obviously, in digital 2D printing, a lot has changed. And I would say there's three fundamental things that changed a lot. One is the obvious one, the chemistry and physics of putting ink on a piece of paper dynamically rather than mechanically. That's the obvious. The second, it really changed the way people work and collaborate. The fact that you could send around files, you could iterate, you could print it, you could edit it, you go back and forth between uh, bits and atoms, constantly going back and forth. And people talk about 
what you write today is better because of the ability of collaboration. Thirdly, it disrupted supply chains. People used to print large volumes of books, store them in a warehouse, ship them as needed, and now things are printed on demand, local for local. When it comes to polymeric parts, we are literally still in a printing press age in many, many ways. And you think about some of the simplest of objects where you would have undercuts and, and uh, you, have a, you have a cavity now. The master template's cut in steel, it's a cavity. You close it up like a printing press. You heat up a plastic, which is like in a lava-like state. You push it in with a 50-ton or a 200-ton injection molding machine. You fill the cavity, you let it cool, and then you open up the cavity and pull the part out, if it has the right symmetry. And as parts get modestly complicated, these injection molding tools start to look like machines with sliders. And you think about undercuts, and you think about threads, and how complicated these, these devices get. And it becomes extremely limiting on what you can design and what you can make. Obviously, you're not going to mold something like a lattice. But there's many, many more things that are challenging to mold because of the constraints of the symmetry of what it is you're making. Then you start thinking about the lead time. And you think about how long it takes to get your hands on these tools, especially as they get more complicated. And the cost, you know, for making an electrical connector, it's not uncommon for these injection molding tools to be a million or a million and a half dollars just for eight, eight parts at a time. And it takes you a year to get your hands on these, and they got to be polished after use after a period of time to make sure that they're pristine. Uh, and it really slows down product teams. You know, we're supporting a lot of autonomous vehicle companies. And you think about when you go from level one autonomy to level four autonomy, increasingly robotic cars, you need eight times the number of sensors to control that car. You go from two miles a wire to 12 miles a wire. You need connectors, you need brackets, you need sensors. You need the little doohickeys to squirt the camera to clean the camera off. You know, when humans drive cars, you clean the windshield. When computers drive you, you clean the cameras. Right? All those things need physical objects. You need one of these injection molding tools. And those product teams are slowed down because of the access to these injection molding machines. And once you have that injection molding machine, you're not changing it. You're locked in. You want to be locked in because it's expensive and it's, it's got, you know, you're starting all over again. And so there's huge program risks. It really slows down uh, what you do. And forget about low volume, high mix products because you can't afford writing off the injection molding machine because of that. Supply chain complexity and then this thing called a minimum order quantity, you know one thing's for sure, you're wrong. You either order too many or didn't order enough. This is an enormous market. Manufacturing is a $12 trillion marketplace. Polymeric products is 1.1 trillion of that, and 30% of that's injection molded. Really uh, a enormous, and it cuts across every sector of the economy where injection molding is playing a big role. Now I'm going to let one of our customers explain to you what it is we do, and then we can unpack it. We love football. The rivalries, the unbelievable plays, the story and tradition, the wins and the losses. Athletes giving everything for the team, leaving it all on the field. It's the players that make the game and the communities that make it whole. Protect them, and you protect it all. Introducing Riddell Diamond Technology powered by carbon. Diamond Technology replaces the current helmet liner with a 3D printed lattice for advanced impact absorption. Riddell uses 3D scanning technology to ensure a precise custom fit for each individual athlete. Combining this with data from on-field impacts, the carbon lattice engine automatically designs and simulates over 1,000 options and selects the optimal liner for each athlete. This custom lattice liner further manages both linear and rotational impact energies. Using a highly damping elastomer, these lattice liners are 3D printed with carbon's revolutionary digital light synthesis, grown from liquid, crafted by light and oxygen. Our partnership with Carbon and the introduction of Diamond Technology underscores Riddell's continued drive to deliver innovative on-field head protection to the game of football and its players. At Carbon, we believe the obstacle is the way. 
we believe in the power of using technology to solve real problems. Our platform enables companies like Riddell to make products that were never thought possible. We can make the unmakeable. With this partnership, Riddell becomes one of the largest users of 3D printers in the world, and we are proud to be at the forefront of digital manufacturing. Welcome to the next generation of protective gear for football and beyond, for every sport and every activity, allowing athletes to be bold, powerful, and protected. Protect them, and you protect it all. So this is a, um, a pretty amazing fusion of hardware, software, and, and material science all coming together. It started with our, our uh, approach for doing printing fundamentally different than how 3D printing was done prior to this. Uh, we use light and oxygen to grow parts. Uh, it's a chemist approach to resin renewal instead of a mechanical engineering approach. And basically what happens is we have a partially UV curable liquid that's sitting in a reservoir, and at the bottom of that reservoir is a very special window. The window is not only transparent to light, but it's also highly permeable to oxygen. Oxygen quenches the photochemistry that the light triggers, and it allows it to never bond to the window. And so it just bonds to the platform. And so we can basically play a movie from underneath uh, with this partially curable liquid and pull the part out where resins come in underneath it. And we were inspired by the Terminator 2 T-1000. You know, and, and the people laugh when I, and, and I, they question whether that was true or not. It was true, but what we're really thinking about is could the mass of the object be derived from the puddle underneath it? That was the physics that we were trying to emulate. And the approach that we took, this is, this is, some, this is an actual image now. This is something called optical coherence tomography. It's like ultrasound imaging. It uses light instead of sound waves. But uh, we're growing apart here continuously at 200 millimeters an hour. You know, most printers operate maybe one to 10 millimeter an hour in growth. And what's happening here is as light comes up, and we, we added nanoparticles to see the contrast. You can see the liquid flow. But notice that when light's coming out from underneath, the liquid that's closest to the window where the light's the most intense does not cure. And that's because there's a field of oxygen coming through it as well. That oxygen quenches the photochemistry and creates what we call a dead zone. That dead zone allows a river of resin to come in underneath the part as we the suction forces as we pull the part up. And in this case, it allows the parts to grow continuously. And we have lots of different modes of how we, how we do the printing. But it's, it's actually complicated. And it's, uh, it's really hard. And it was easy in the beginning when we made simple chess pieces. It was good to get Series A funding on chess pieces. Uh, but it became really hard to do this well. And what we, really, what we realized is we needed to get the human out of the process. This is a software-controlled chemical reaction to grow parts. And there's a lot of parameters that we use and that we had to develop a complete digital twin of the process that has heat transfer, mass transfer, reaction kinetics, mechanics. We had to build our own finite element analysis uh, uh, cloud-based tool to get this to work. And there's about 20 parameters that we have to measure and control to get this to work well, to control the thickness of the dead zone, to control the oxygen flux. We have to get resin to the deepest pixel at any given moment. And as the geometry changes, that path distance changes all the time, depending on the cross section that you're making. And so the point is, it's, um, it is a software controlled process. Our, uh, the user will design their part and their favorite design software uh, tools out there, like SolidWorks and other things. And then they enter the, the, the ecosystem of the printer, and you select a resin. And when you select a resin, it takes you down different paths of the software because every resin's different. Its dose to cure is different. Its viscosity is different. Uh, the mechanics of the green state of the part as it's being printed, and all that matters a lot. And so we have a print button. And it's really this detailed chemical physical model behind the scenes that makes this work. So we wrapped all this into an amazing uh, printer. And uh, a little bit of a story, our founding vice president of engineering, Craig Carlson, is an icon out in Silicon Valley. When, he's a couple years older than me, and, and uh, when he was an undergrad at Stanford, Scott Cook bought his company and became QuickBooks at Intuit. And he was vice president of product at Intuit for 17 years. Took a year off, helped raise his kids, 
Uh, he's a software guy. He, he loved the environment. He loved cars. And he joined a little company called Tesla Motors uh, before Elon got there. Elon didn't found it. Others did. And my point is that he brought out the Roadster and the Model S. And the fundamental decision that they made in the very beginning was that every piece of hardware on that car was going to be smart hardware that was going to be remotely controllable with software. From the door handles to the radios to the motors, everything's electric and smart. And we built our printer with the same DNA. And just like the Tesla car, we do over-the-air software upgrades every six to eight weeks. And we get a lot of telemetry from our printers. They're all on our servers at AWS. Uh, and we do over-the-air software upgrades. And as we introduce new resins, new features, and new details of the chemical, physical model, the printers are getting better with time. There's a network effect. The printers haven't changed. The first printer hasn't changed in, over, in four years. The resins we launched four years ago haven't changed, but we can print stuff today we couldn't print a year ago because of the details of our understanding of what's going on. So we have a couple of printers on the right. That's our M-Class printer. The far right's the M1. The M2 is twice the build area. That's the one next to it. The L1 is what we thought of as our Adidas printer. It's 10 times the build area, but we're using that now in a lot of other areas, including dental models and Riddell helmets and, and others. And then the thing on the lower right is a spinner. We're, we're getting away from solvent-based processing and high-volume manufacturing. These are all dry processing, reclaim resin, reuse it, pollution prevention pays, you know, all those things that matter a lot as you scale up. And now we're beginning to integrate everything into fully automated systems. Uh, and all these products are sitting on Carbon's manufacturing cloud. And it's really now a system uh, solution in a full manufacturing digital workflow that enables us to work. Now, some of the keys for this, so just to back up, if you print really fast um, and you still use UV curable liquids, you're really only going to make brittle plastics. Right? UV curables can only take you so far. And I'm a polymer guy. My background is in, I was on the faculty at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill for 25 years and we graduate 80 PhD students all in polymer science. This is sort of our wheelhouse. And we knew coming into this that a light-based technology would not get us into the applications that we wanted because the materials were not going to be suitable. And so in order to figure that out or to crack the code, what we did is we broke the problem into two. It's well known that some of the best polymers are derived from reactive liquids. And you think about epoxy glue. And given where I'm at, I'm sure everybody's used epoxy glue. And you go to the hardware store, and it comes in two tubes labeled 2A and 2B, right? And a stoichiometry set up so anybody can do it. And those liquids come together and they start to react. This is the way epoxies work, the way polyurethanes work, silicone, cyanate esters. But because 3D printing traditionally was so slow, everybody stayed away from reactive liquids. Because we were going 125, 100, even 1,000 times faster, we knew we can get into these liquids. We could also, because we're chemists, we can tune the pot life. But we also needed to make those reactive liquids UV curable. And we call that dual cure, both UV curable and reactive. And that was the trick to get to an amazing set of properties. And so now we have properties that mimic the entire range of polymeric materials that you'd like to have in a, in a wide range of applications. So now not only are we printing fast, but we have the properties to be a finished product coming out of a printer. Those two things were essential. And so now we've got materials. Um, that are highly distinguished in a UV curable space. We have elastomers. We have elastomers that have um, amazing tear strength and high energy recovery, and that's what's great for a, a running shoe. And it's all about controlled energy and highly resilient materials. That's not what you want in a football helmet. You want to dissipate the energy. You want a molecularly damping material. It's a very different material, and you, you can see the response on these two very different types of elastomers. We have rigid plastics. Uh, that have a high impact strength, that have a glass transition temperature of 130. Uh, we have new ones coming out at 150, and we have some at 230 degrees Celsius, right? Use temperature up to 230. These are cyanate esters. We have silicone materials. We have a new flame retardant material, so you start taking advantage of phosphorus and bromium type additives. We have a fully bioresorbable material. Uh, that goes away after being uh, absorbed in a body after a few months. So every one of these resins opens up the TAM. It's the same printer, and it opens up the TAM. This is a, one of their new RPU-130 that will be launching soon. 
Uh, it's going to take over all sorts of eyeglass applications, uh, lots of interior automotive applications. Uh, it's a really, really amazing material. We have an advanced thermoset that's going to be uh, useful for all different types of electrical connectors uh, from the, uh, the entire gamut of all the use space in that, in that area. And then we have also bioresorbable materials. Just give you a sense of the, some of the new materials coming, coming online. You think about the applications of having a tool with these kinds of properties available to people. We have a huge interest in sustainability um, and using bio-based feedstocks instead of petroleum-based feedstocks. So we have a number of resins that um, have 43, 45 weight percent of uh, derived from corn, polyols derived from corn. Uh, we also have fully recyclable and reversible thermosets. So the ability of printing things that would be used transiently, transiently as a mold, think about Invisalign-like products and dental models. We have dental models now that are fully recyclable. You go through from the liquid state, you print it, you use it, and you can turn it back to liquid and it becomes a feedstock for the next resin. So because we think this is going to be big, our team is highly motivated to be thinking about the sustainability dimensions uh, of these kinds of things. And then for me, probably the most exciting aspect is uh, this fusion of material science and software. You know, there's been a lot of academic papers published about lattices, um, but the range of materials you can make the lattice out, out of has been very limited, uh, and it wasn't scalable. And so I actually think that despite all the great papers, if it would have been a more commercially viable area, there'd be, you know, 10 times more people working on it, but you just couldn't scale it. Uh, well, now it's scalable, and so we do a lot of things with different lattices. We think about textures. Uh, in many ways, textures, for me, back to the 2D printing, textures are the new font, right? Emotion, expression, aesthetics, but it goes beyond that. It becomes function, becomes wettability, becomes friction control, breathability, all sorts of examples that go well beyond uh, aesthetics. And so for us, this is really the fusion and I thought, given there's a lot of entrepreneurs here, I'd sort of show you the progression. We did our Series A on the thing on the left, number one. That was our digital light synthesis, uh, light and oxygen to grow parts. That's where we started, but that's just brittle plastics. That's not going to take you very far. Really fast, but it was, it was our Series B that I promised everybody we'd be able to build a connected product and we'd have figure out a window technology and also figure out uh, that's scalable and then figure out how to get real polymer properties out of a light-based printer. And then it's really introducing a product that's connected. And now we're getting in all the design software and full manufacturing solutions. And so I like this slide, and it's, it really capsules the entire uh, trajectory that Carbon has, has been on. And so with this now, it's really been driving uh, people into production uh, and really take the, what's been a dream for a lot of people in 3D printing that just never got there because it was a technological shortcoming. And so we look at this across multiple sectors. And, um, and, you know, as polymers, polymers are really a horizontal platform. Uh, Ellen Coleman is our lead director. She was chairman and CEO of DuPont. Um, and you think about polymers going into lots of different vertical sectors in what you do. Uh, Alan Mullally, who was a CEO of Ford Motor Company, uh, has been Mr. And he was, before that, he was CEO of Boeing Commercial Aircraft Division, has been thinking about digital manufacturing his whole career. He was a lead engineer on the 777, committed them to a fully digital manufacturing before, without any physical mock-ups. And he also pioneered uh, hardware as a service. He, when he was at Boeing, he wanted his supplier, GE, to no longer sell him jet engines. Right? This is the supplier, uh, or the OEM driving a supplier into a subscription model. He wanted the most fuel-efficient jet engines. He wanted to be future-proof from obsolescence while he built airplanes. And that's really drove, that kind of partnership model is what we've driven in our business. So let me just show you a couple examples. Um, uh, Adidas is what we've, we've become uh, pretty no, well known for, and, and it's really one of the biggest examples. It's a killer app, a huge example of a scale up. And I, as a, I get to wear sneakers all the time now, which is a lot of fun. Um, and uh, it's an amazing set of products that have come out. Uh, and this already is the largest example of a finished product made out of a 3D printer and uh, by leaps and bounds and uh, it's really scaling. You know, Adidas makes uh, almost 500 million pairs of shoes a year and uh, we're, we're on a trajectory to make a, a reasonable fraction of that in a high-performance running shoe. So it's very exciting 
And as it scales up, it's lots of equipment coming together into a factory. Uh, this is what our printers look like in a factory-like setting. Uh, and uh, it's really exciting to see a first digital factories coming together uh, in a scale-up. Uh, Riddell, you know, we've been able to take um, our partner Riddell in eight months launch a product. And this is a speed of innovation. And they've taken over you know, five million data points and how uh, different types of impacts. And to be able to bring forward a personalized helmet, this is me reliving the glory days. Um, there's a lot of truth to those old songs about reliving the glory days. But you, know, you take a smock and you put it over your head, and whether you got a hair bun or not, and it take you know, conformal setting, it's got all these fiduciary marks, and you scan your head. It's a personalized helmet. Uh, it fills the annulus between a standard shell and your head and, it, and it, for protection, being personalized, it really becomes meaningful. And you do that with all our cloud-based software. And uh, you can specify what kind of make So all you have to do for our, with our software is you design the primitive CAD, just the surface of what you want to make. The customer specifies what mechanical properties they want. And we have a library of lattices in a cloud that we're able to go through tens of thousands of options. And then and simulate mechanical properties. We've got a cloud-based finite element analysis tool that will go through the mechanical properties of all these, and we get to tap the cloud, so it's easy for us to tap lots of different simulations. Uh, and uh, and then we go to a printability module, simulate its printability, see if there's any defects in printing, and do all that before we hit print. And this allows you to scale up, and especially allows you to do personalized products at scale, without human intervention on the design. And it's really getting exciting now, because now we're actually doing this. There's some really cool things that people haven't thought about in lattices before. Uh, the one on the far right is one of my favorite. You mix thin struts with thick struts, and the thin struts can dissipate the energy, and the thick struts can hold up the mechanical properties. So you have combinations of approaches, and you can have biomimetic approaches. There's a faculty member at the University of Florida that's getting our machine uh, Lakeisha Williams, and she studies um, uh, woodpeckers. Woodpeckers don't get concussions, right? And looking at what structures and the bio biology has evolved to supporting and dissipating mechanical properties. I'm excited about this one. Um, we have the first 3D printed parts on a commercial vehicle out of Detroit. Happened in January. Now, people are nodding their head, but you know, 3D printing has been around for 25 years. Right? No one has been able to get to this point. It took us a long time. It took us a couple years to get the materials approved, but we replaced a 30% glass-filled PBT with our epoxy 82 material and went through all it. This is all Ford standard testing. So we've got parts on the Ford Mustang, uh, F-150 truck, and we have replacement parts uh, for the Ford Focus. So really getting into commercialized uh, parts in the automotive industry. And we're powering all sorts of new technologies, uh, fluidic devices, uh, really complicated fluidic channels, including inkjet print heads, really th uh, things where you're controlling air or liquids of different types. Uh, would normally make six or seven parts to be assembled like sandwiches to create channels. You can print them as one. Now you can get flow patterns and back pressures that are very different than assembled products, laminar flows where you, where you want them, turbulent flows where you want them, and do things you couldn't do with other manufacturing techniques. Uh, the thing on the lower right is the, uh, this was just launched on a NASA mission. mission. These, uh, these uh, were sort of the size of a loaf of bread. Um, but they're going to be inspecting the space station in June. It's the first untethered autonomous vehicles that are going to circle a space station. And the cold gas thruster units were all made of our cyanate ester material. Uh, controlling these little uh, devices going around a space station. Uh, on the upper right is our material's got the great, the right elect dielectric properties uh, for millimeter wave telecommunications at 39 gigahertz, which is being used as the last mile for 5G connected systems. Uh, and so this is from Harris Corporation. So these advanced materials open up all sorts of uh, really important uh, applications, and the one in the middle is one of our printers with really small pixels. That's an electron micrograph. Uh, and the base of these undercut structures is only 50 microns. Uh, so amazing uh, types of structures and MEMS and, and, and devices like that. A lot of our printers go in the dental marketplace. 
and it's, uh, it's a remarkable place. 3D printing has already been in dentistry. Uh, we we're entering, this is the one space where we entered a, a, a competitive space. Uh, we're printing faster. Uh, we've got all the data, all the software, uh, and it's really gonna be differentiated on materials and reliability, is ultimately, we have these machines are up and running all the time, they're workhorses, they're data-centric, and as you start introducing materials, you can really change people's lives. On the, on the far right, it's the world's first FDA-approved 3D printed dentures. And uh, you know, making dentures hasn't changed in 100 years. And it's done in a very artisanal uh, environment with these labs with lots of people making stuff. And, um, and typically, to get your dentures fitted for dentures, you're in a chair eight different times to get, get it fitted properly. As you get into advanced digital technologies, this can be reduced to one chair, one chair side visit. Uh, it's, it's substantially cheaper to make the dentures this way. And I've heard so many stories about people losing their dentures in the old folks' home, and uh, the dog gets them. I, one lady told me she rattled it up in a newspaper, threw it in a fireplace by mistake. And you're back in that chair eight times. Well, with us, you just order a four-pack, right? It's digital. You've got it all. You know, that's what's going to change. And when you're, we've got, we got folks up in Anchorage where people come for hours to travel to get to, the, to get to these systems and their dentists. And it really can be dramatically different in how it changes lives. We have a fully bioresorbable material, really opening up some new, really cool applications in, uh, in surgical applications. And then, as I mentioned, all sorts of uh, advanced materials and, and really small pixels uh, to make things that uh, uh, really can, uh, only your imagination can hold you back. So um, for the entrepreneurs out there, it's also important to think about your business model. And our business model, I think, is as innovative as our technology. It's a subscription model. This is the very first piece of manufacturing hardware that's ever gone out via subscription mo model. Uh, and it's a, um, uh, you're never going to be obsolete, you know, you're, you're never going to have a, 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 a a dead piece of hardware, or because the hardware is getting better with time, with all the software upgrades, uh, and it's a constant renewal. So you're never going to be saddled with legacy technology, and it's uh, really allowed our customers to to think very differently about their businesses. Uh, we have lots of customers in a lot of different areas, and we work with universities, we work with small companies, we work with large companies, we work with injection molding shops, we work with dental labs. There's a lot of similarities between those two, <clears throat> and things have really taken off for us. Uh, we've been growing by triple digits. We manage a business like an install base. Um, and when you move to production, that's where the resin volumes take off. And 2018 was a year of, uh, the year of scaling for us and scaling for our customers. And it went from a modestly growing uh, business to one where once you go into production, it's uh, hang on because it's a, it's a lot of resin and a lot of reliability and printers running 24-5 or 24-6 and fleets of printers, and it's really a very, very different business at that point. So in summary, what are the fundamental tenets for the business? We've cracked the code on how to make polymeric parts uh, really fast with right materials. So real parts made digitally. But it didn't stop there. What's really pulling us forward is our customers are making the unmakeable. Lattices, consolidating six parts into one part. These things really drive, uh, drive this business forward. We are disintermediating the classic product development cycle, where normally you go through design, then you go through a prototyping technology that's not your final technology, you're using a material that's not your final material, and you do all that because you've got to cut an injection molding tool and you better get it right. It's not a good career move to screw that up uh, before you go into production. What's happening is our customers are designing products on the means of production. And they're allowed to, they're enabled, they're accelerating product teams. And ultimately, I think that's what we do. We allow product teams to make what's next now and not be uh, burdened by the supply chain. The subscription model is really powerful. It allows people to get into the business. It future-proofs them from obsolescence. Uh, it allows us to make and manage promises. We say not for weapons. Uh, it's a core values for the companies. It's some things that are important for us. Um, and it gives us a lot of pr predictability in our business. Uh, We've broken the back of the classic product cost cycle. Normally, people say whether you make one or a thousand, the cost doesn't change. Well, we're making hundreds of thousands and millions. And the cost can change. It can dramatically go down. And we're procuring resins at such large volumes, we've been dropping the price of the resin. We started off at $300 a liter, and then went to $150, now we're $50 a liter. 
And we've been, we've been passing the cost downs due to scale up directly to the customers to see this new future of manufacturing. And then ultimately the advantage of everything you think of a Silicon Valley company and connected products over there, software upgrades, data, 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 understanding your business really well, uh, allowing you to have a network effect. The more people use the printer, the better it gets. Uh, new resin launches become easy, even globally, uh, and predictive service on your hardware becomes really, really important. So with that, let me wrap up. Um, look, I'm a big fan of using light as a chisel to make things. And you have to look at, back, are there any other manufacturing technologies where light has driven the manufacturing process? And there's a great example, and that's Moore's Law. Every computer chip, every memory device is made with patterned light, but that's patterned light in two dimensions. We're using patterned light in three dimensions, and in many ways it's a lot easier than working close to the wavelength of light, and it really opens up some neat opportunities. So um, that's our story. Uh, happy to talk more about it, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Joe. This was truly disruptive on multiple levels. On uh, new materials, faster speeds, you know, hardware as a service models. Um, so I was really impressed with that presentation. Um, now we're going to transition into a fireside chat. Uh, we're going to welcome Patricia Miller. Uh, she's the CEO of Matrix 4. This is an injection molding company. Uh, and we'll welcome Joe back up on the stage for questions. Well, thank you for that, Joe. Um, I think when any of us look at disruptive technology, it's typically in just one of the segments. And carbon, I think, is one of those fundamental pillars for us as we look at Industry 4.0. That's leveraged not just technology, uh, software, materials, um, really looking at every single area um, uh, to drive the business. Um, Clearly, my brain doesn't think the way yours does. Um, and I'm curious, as you made the transition from academia for 25 years and really exploring resin, what was the big dream of carbon? And do you feel like you're there yet? And what's next? Can you hear me? Yeah, great. So, um, yeah, thank you for your question. Um, you know, for us, it started off with a frustration in how 3D printing was. I'm a, as I mentioned, I'm a polymer guy and uh, graduated over 80 PhD students in the polymer science field. 50% were women in underrepresented groups in the sciences. And, and I, I think diversity is the kinds of things that drive innovation. And, you know, for us, looking at all the excitement of 3D printing, that we were left wanting because it was so cool yet so much limited to trinkets or one-offs that it wasn't gonna really make the impact in society. And you know, in Industry 4.0, you look at all the, harnessing all the technologies in Industry 4.0 and automation and data and robotics and AI and everything is there except a scalable digital production method. And uh, we thought this was like the last piece, the linchpin, if you will, of really unle unleashing all the value that Industry 4.0 aspired to or espoused to have, but it was held back by the technology. And I could ask a million questions. I think you guys have a link to be able to post any questions, which should come to this large iPad I have. Uh, but in the interim, I'll ask them. I know uh, I've loved working with Carbon, and I love your team. I know, uh, Bob, let me know today some parts are going to one of our clients. Um, as a manufacturer, I definitely see the integration between the technology of Carbon and injection mold machines on my floor. Um, but I'm so curious, what do you foresee um, is the future of what a factory floor setting looks like? Um, and is tooling and injection mold machines displaced? Is it a collaboration? Um, uh, what's that dream for you? So, uh, you know, you saw that one photo 
of our printers lined up. And you know what's interesting is the factory is like really quiet. Parts are just growing. Uh, it's just light doing its thing. Um, and you know the challenge now is is really understanding how do you drive the cost out of this process, right? The printing process itself, the resin development itself, those were great and important, but arguably just the beginning. As you start thinking about with all the smart hardware and all the data, and with all the traceable parts, you know, all these parts have a, have a data matrix on them, and uh, and we do we do testing on every part because we can. And we have instrons that are that will do a compression test on every part, and that data gets streamed to the record for that part in the cloud. And so we have a massive amount of data accumulating on parts, and that allows you to get into certified parts, parts that are certified for performance, certified for utility. Uh, obviously, that's meaningful in life sciences. And the FDA is, is increasingly going to want that data, right? They should have that data. We you know, we know every photon that goes into every part. We know which lot of resin. All that gets traceable in the record. We call it the provenance of the part. But you can also think about the aftermarket and what it's being used for and continue to populate that record. And then it really flows into the warehouse in the cloud and on demand. And you know all the things that people have been talking about related to the, you know, a digital factory uh, that can print anything, and you think about the mix of your products, file management, marketplace management, and it really becomes a, the digital world can really be imagined uh, to happen now. We're actually doing it. Yeah. Well, and thinking about that, um, as you mentioned in, in your slides, there hasn't been a ton of uh, disruption in this industry segment for a while. Um, and, and carbon has had the ability to disrupt it in multiple ways. Um, when did you start believing that this could be what it is? And, and recognizing that we're in a, um, a maker space um, with a lot of companies that are just getting off the ground and, and maybe challenged or get, not getting the funding they want when they want it. Um, what can you say about that process when you do think something that may be unthinkable? So, um, I, so as an academic, um, I started several companies as a, as a faculty member, but always stayed a faculty member and hired CEOs and was a board member, a consultant, and, but I was never on the field with one of my companies. Um, I taught entrepreneurship, but I wasn't on the field. That's, that's what teachers do often. Um, <laughs> And, um, and so to me, it was a way to really learn viscerally what it means to, to lead and, and to do that. But, you know, I've had lots of companies that I've, we've, you know, we've done a handful of companies, and very often when you get into something, um, you have, I can paint a vision for easily, and, but once you get into it, you start to often, for me, I realized that the, you, could, you couldn't do this or you couldn't do that, and the vision got curtailed. And, uh, and this thing has gone the other direction. And, uh, and people started adding to the, you know, to the canvas, to the fabric of what we were doing. And the vision kept getting, you know, as things worked, it got bigger and bigger. And so we didn't have this full-blown view. We were just printing fast, right? And then we realized we needed to print real parts. I mean, it was really one step in front of another, and, and, and it was methodically evolving in front of us. But, you know, when you launch a company, the first 18 months is, to me, the most nerve-wracking for lots of reasons, but for me, heavily about the intellectual property, especially with the way patent law is done today. You don't know what other people have published for 18 months. And those that invest in companies, you're, run, you're really running blind uh, because other people's patents are not published yet or applications are not published. And so there's, a diff there's different phases of anxiety as you launch a company. And 18 months, I think, is some of the hardest. And so I, you know, I really resonate with all of you going through the early stages. I've done it a half dozen times, and those are very different phases. Um, and uh, but it's a, you know a little bit of luck and a lot of hard work, and and a great team can be really powerful. Um, looking at where we're at now in Industry 4.0, and obviously with uh, 
3D printing and additive manufacturing changing at the scale it is, even within carbon, what dots do you still think need to be connected for us to get where we want to be with manufacturing? I think unequivocally is what the killer apps are. You know, I think finding the killer apps are really crucial. Adidas was a great killer app for us. And we all thought, boy, if we could make running shoes economically at scale, the world was our oyster. And uh, we were going to let, and, and to find the right partner. There's a lot of companies that you want to partner with that, like, you think about the company, and they think of themselves as on top of the pinnacle of a mountain, and they look at your startup and they say, if you want to work with us, you've got to climb the mountain and come up to us. Adidas was very different. And they used this metaphor. They said, we're going to come down the mountain and help pull you up together. And having the right partnership is absolutely critical. And they were really great. And, but, and in dental was the other thing we wanted to get into. And that's a killer app in production, bringing state-of-the-art materials there. But what are the next killer apps? I think it's really critical to drive the technology forward. And for us, helmets, helmets, helmets is a huge killer app right now. It's going to accelerate faster than, than our Adidas ramp has been uh, because foam just doesn't have the properties that a lattice can give you. And we have the molecular damping materials. We have the software. Helmets is a huge marketplace. Automotive is a huge marketplace and allowing all the product team with these new materials. So it's all materials driven that allows all these killer apps to actually f emerge in front of us. And, and they build off of each other. I'll, I'll definitely trade my Gucci sneakers for your Adidas ones. <laughs> uh, so speaking of that, though, obviously, um, uh, I can't wait till we have a carbon printer in our factory. Um, we, we can't wait either. <laughs> in advance of that, though, we've had the ability to work with carbon in small volume. And obviously, there's a the large volume of the apps you're chatting about. Um, for the audience, where do you foresee um, best use, or are you positioning carbon for, you know, the one-off to 10 and the prototype phase all the way to large production, recognizing the economies of scale, um, or, or for someone that's unfamiliar, where would you want them to position it? Yeah, so if you think about 3D printing today, it's about an $8 billion marketplace. Half of that's metals, half of it's polymers. That includes the materials, that includes the printers, that includes the software, the whole industry, $8 billion. Injection molding is a $330 billion market. It's a very different marketplace. And, uh, and for us, we wanted to keep our eye on production. And that's, that's where we're going. And so think, and for polymers, that's, there's a lot of opportunity. And I think ultimately is what is the category we're creating? I think it's... One, I love reading books. A great book is Play Bigger, a great book about category creation. Another one is Blitz Scaling. Reed Hoffman's book is an, another great one, and you think about opportunities with that. And for us, it's, it's really understanding what our technology can do, where we're differentiated, what are our materials enable, and then scale that as quickly as possible. And another great book, Jeffrey Moore, Crossing the Chasm or Inside the Tornado, it's going from niche to niche to niche. Get, and get the momentum going of all these products happening. And every one of these products to us is like a bowling pin, maybe too many metaphors here, but a bowling pin that could be knocked over in and of itself, but that can knock over another bowling pin. You know, Riddell was the first bowling pin in the bowling alley that we've knocked over, and now there's lots of different helmet applications that continues to build momentum as we go forward uh, in replacing foam, <coughs> with an elastomer lattice of a different properties. Uh, I think uh, back in the day, there was the movie The Graduate that said plastics is the future, right? Um, I think you're clearly making it still the future. Um, speaking of just materials overall and, and plastics being seen as a slightly negative um, right now, can you speak to you know, what you see in those implications? Clearly, you're looking at sustainability. Um, but anything you can comment on plastic in, in the grand scheme of things? Yeah, for sure. So you know, at the end of the day, it's, you know, we think this is going to be big, and we've got to be paying attention to these issues front and center out of the gate. And so for us, environmental stewardship uh, comes, comes in a lot of different flavors. One is, as I mentioned, you know, we, um, uh, we've developed 
dry post-processing. You know, these are printed in a, in a resin or some excess resin on the surface. We do a lot of spinning now. Excess resin gets spun off, it gets collected, and that gets reused. So we have dry post-processing as one piece. As we dematerial, as our customers dematerialize parts, making them high-strength, lightweight parts, you know, we're making a lot of different car parts more lightweight, and so we're powering the more fuel-efficient vehicles and electric vehicles uh, as a key part. And then you get into the resins and the details about, as I mentioned, some of the bio-based feedstocks, an important theme, but probably a more important theme is re true recyclability. And whether you go into uh, the next feedstock for the resin or, or thermoplastic applications, you know, we think a lot about that. But what digital is going to bring, if you think about elimination of, of inventory, you know, there's hundreds of billions of dollars of inventory, a lot of it plastic parts that age, that have to be in climate-controlled buildings, that are in climate-controlled warehouses throughout the planet, just sitting there for decades, waiting for use. Right? Thomas Friedman, in one of his books, talked about at any given time, 2% of the world's GDP is in, is in UPS trucks getting distributed. So you think about if you could, if you could make uh, components, running shoes or helmets, the European market, they're made in Europe. The Asian market, they're made in Asia. And then the factory starts making other stuff that you don't have to ship. Right? And so I think there's some big mega trends that uh, make digital uh, drive a lot of the things that we as a society need to have happen regard of environmental stewardship and, and elimination of pollution that come in a lot of different ways. Can you chat about the subscription model that you have and, and perhaps for some in the audience that may be at the startup phase or bootstrapping, what that looks like from going uh, from early phase into f to full scale? So we live in a subscription age, and if you're trying to get your business funded, um, you know, thinking deeply about that as a driver for lots of reasons. One, it, it drives an intimate relationship with your customer, because they can walk away, and it aligns you with their happiness, and we think a lot about that. And, our, and then not only your, their, your, their happiness, but can they rely on you? And that drives a relationship, so really, that's an important part. <clears throat> the... the um, the subscription model future-proofs them from obsolescence. And so for, there's all sorts of reasons from the customer point of view that a subscription model drives their, uh, their affinity for your company and your products. From a business point of view, it gives you um, a very different perspective on predictability because it's like an install base. And you got to think about the install base, you got to think about secondary markets, and it's, it gives you a level of predictability that you don't see in a, in a uh, transactional sale of hardware. And so it's a very different model in that regard. We also have the resin store. We have about 50 different resins. And as I mentioned, because of the complications of our process, every resin has to be tuned for our printing um, in order for it to print well and reliably. On that resin store, we have over a dozen third-party resins. So you think about it like an app store. You have first-party apps and third-party apps from Apple. Uh, you know, we have our own resins that we designed and we established a chemical supply chain. But we've been able to work with a lot of great chemical companies. We told them generally how to design for our process. And then we tune, uh, we do some, a lot of key measurements and tune the software for their resins. And now we have a number of third-party resins uh, on, our, uh, on our resin store. So we get to grow the, the range of resins uh, and the reliability and, and diversity of our supply chain. Um, what do you think is the biggest challenge currently? Technology, financing, uh, marketing? <clears throat> Execution. You know, we, uh, as a start, we're about 400 employees now, and I used to tell everyone in the company that we wanted our customers to love us and love our products. And a year and a half ago, we changed that. We wanted our customers to love and can count on us and our products. And when you start moving in manufacturing, that's a very different stage. And we have been growing so fast, um, it's really strained our supply chain and getting in front of things. And so the things that keep me up at night is making sure we have some, you know, redundant supply on resins globally. Uh, every morning I get a printout of all the printers 
uh, and any comments that anybody's made regarding that those prints and make sure that you know we got our our teams are on them. Um, you know we don't know what people print. Uh, that's you know they, they, they we have a lot of telemetry, a lot of operational data, a lot of metadata, but the design file sits on a printer on a on a computer on the printer behind their firewall and it can be encrypted. We don't have that part of it, but we get a lot of operational metadata and they have an opportunity to comment. And so that allows us to work closely with them. Uh, so it's really global scaling, especially when you get into production, uh, because if your customer is relying on that for revenue and they bet on it and they've probably canceled other products to count on your products. And if you're not there, you're not there. And it's, it's challenging. And speaking of that, and with some of your partners like Adidas or Ford, um, can you can you speak to who owns the technology in those partnerships and what you envision the future in terms of? Do you see one day, you know, Ford's going to have the ability to print spare parts at a dealer? So that one of those three parts is a spare part, and it's on it's for the Ford Focus, and it's a it's a legacy part that the tools are gone. And the parts are just about dwindled, and they needed to either make new parts the old-fashioned way or go this direction, and so we're there already. Uh, the intellectual property, what people design is their own designs. We, that's not us. You know, we've developed the technology. We've developed a lot of resins. Now we have third-party resins. Uh, but what people design is their own intellectual property. Um. What would you say to an entrepreneur and what would you say to a manufacturer as we look at current trends and where things are headed? Well, I'm a big fan of entrepreneurship, uh, as you can imagine now. Um, you know, as an academic, and the reason I, got, I feel this way is um, you get to control your own destiny, right? There's a lot of what I would call entrenched interests in partnerships that you can't control. And so if you're peddling a technology and you've got to rely on somebody else to commercialize it, they have a lot of choices and, and they may not believe in it. Um, another great book out there by uh, Peter Thiel, uh, Zero to One, uh, talks about in a zero to one idea, which is a breakthrough idea, or what he believes is a breakthrough idea, a zero to one idea, and an incremental idea is a one to N idea. His thesis in his book is that a zero to one idea is an idea that you alone believe in. And that takes a lot of fortitude uh, when you alone to believe in something. And, 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 but, you know, when you get things funded, that's what Sand Hill Road is great about because you can get nine no's and one yes and you're in the game. And, uh, and that's, you know, I think entrepreneurship and venture capital is a uniquely American craft uh, that has really been driving a lot of things. And, and I think it's... Uh, uh, I'm, I'm just really believe in it, and in a way, it can transform the economy and transform the health and well-being of society. What partnership would you love to see Carbon working on, or what product space? Well, <clears throat> my career has been at the interface of science, engineering, and medicine. Um, so I can tell you, nothing warms our heart more than uh, the kinds of things we're doing in medical products, and to have fully bioresorbable materials. Um, you know, the dentures, you know, there's 60 million Americans, 60 million Americans that cannot afford dentures. Uh, we just stood up a 501c3 in Durham, North Carolina, along with affordable dentures, where the dental students at the University of North Carolina are going to be um, offering their services with our equipment and resins to give people access to technology, great, great oral care. And, you know, because oral care, you help people smile and eat properly. And, you know, coronary disease is tied to oral health. And it can have a really big impact. So to me, that from our software engineers, our mechanical engineers, our material scientists, I think we would all say, you know, we like, we like cars, we like running shoes, we like satellites. But, you know, when you, when you impact people's lives, it can be really motivating. Absolutely. Um, speaking of that, do you ever see carbon producing tissue or organs? So there's a whole field of bioprinting, which is depositing cells and precursors to cells. We don't do that per se, and that's a really exciting field. But we, we with these bioresorbable materials, we're, we would be making the scaffolds um, for doing those things. One of my students, former students, she's on a faculty in chemical engineering at University of Delaware, and she's 
studying uh, deposition of particles in the airway. And she's, make, she's recapitulating the mechanical properties and function of a lung uh, using lattices and materials and elastomers. And I think there's so many really cool things coming together in that space that is uh, uh, really motivating. How do you manage all of the data points that you collect? Uh, you, mean, you mean from the printers themselves or just the people yeah. in general? I yeah, and the data collection you get back from it's, the printer. You know, uh, we have data scientists and it's, it's pretty sophisticated. And as a chemist, I'm, I'm in so much awe of, of our software people. We, we just announced uh, our Carbon Fellows, the first example for us, a new category of employee. Um, and uh, Abhishek uh, was one of the Carbon Fellows, and he is an 11-year veteran at Google, and he set up, he's our software architect. He set up all the cloud infrastructure at Google, and uh, they have that kind of horsepower uh, behind us, and we have an amazing software team uh, with, uh, you know, uh, and you know, over, over 60 Tesla employees at Carbon, lots of Google employees. We're sort of a respite for Tesla employees. Uh, but we have lots of Apple and Facebook and, and uh, Yahoo and, and Google employees. And, and getting everybody to work together between hardware, software, and chemistry is, uh, is what we enjoy the most of. So I had gone to TEDx Chicago today, and one of the things they you know, obviously chat about is what big questions should we be asking. Um, so as we wrap up today, um, would love to just know your thoughts on what should we be asking in this space right now in Industry 4.0 and in manufacturing, or what are you asking yourself? Yeah, I, I look forward to the metal world asking some of the same questions we've been doing in polymers. You know, what are the killer apps, and where's the differentiation? Um, you know, I think that's a field that's struggling, and it, it, needs, a, it needs a breakout technology, uh, like I think we've had in polymers. Um, but, I, you know, I really, th you know, I would encourage people to be thinking big and, not, and think, not thinking incrementally, but to launch something that's, you know, it's really differentiating. You know, Strategy is all about being different. And I think having a, a you know, a unique approach that's compelling uh, that can actually be one of those breakthrough technologies and then for us, ultimately, it's providing a tool to amazing product teams around the world that can really challenge how things are designed and made. And we think it's going to accelerate new waves of growth because I think product teams ultimately are the tipping point of the, of the, of the economy and allowing product teams to go faster and create tremendous value and performance and environmental stewardship are the kinds of things that inspire us. Well, thank you for answering my questions and all of our questions, and we're super excited to see what Carbon continues to do. Well, thank you for all, uh, for all you being here, and uh, really appreciate uh, the opportunity. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone. Um, we really appreciate all the questions. It was very helpful, um, very insightful. Um, I thought this talk was really disruptive. Um, this topic is so dear to me. So thank you, Joe. Thank you so much for, for having me. Um, also, so for the next 30 minutes, we're gonna be sticking around. The bar is gonna be open. You can grab a drink. We're also gonna be giving tours of mHub. So if you're interested in seeing the space and learning more about mHub and what we do, uh, we'll be offering tours in the back. Uh, thank you all for coming and have a good night.